Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Peter Giesman here from AJS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning for another another uh, demo live from a workshop somewhere in Australia. And this week we're coming to you from sunny Melbourne, and it's my delight to introduce uh, Chris Sherwin to you. Chris is from uh, Chris Sherwin Design, and Chris is going to be teaching us how to make a hollow ring. Good morning, Chris. How are you? Very well, thanks, Peter. Good welcome, to see everybody. You. Yeah. Now, Chris, could you please start the ball rolling by uh, just defining what a hollow ring is? Indeed. Yeah, a hollow ring is a, is a form that uh, uh, has a sleeve and an outer section. So it has a, an external section and an internal section, and it's obviously hollow internally. Uh, there are many ways you can produce that. But, uh, yeah, we're going to be going through. I've got lots of samples to show people, and we'll talk about the different materials we can use to create a hollow ring uh, and how to do a basic silver construction of a hollow ring. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's get into it. Where do we start, Chris? Well, I'll start by showing a few samples just to sort of enlighten people a little bit, um, perhaps introduce myself a little bit. Sure. Um, people may know me. Uh, uh, I've been making jewellery for 38 years. I'm a goldsmith, silversmith and platinum smith. So I do make very large work, which you can possibly see behind me. I make table centerpieces and things, but I also do fine jewellery as well and work in platinum. So um, I've been teaching for a very long time. I taught at RMIT for 12 years and uh, I was the coordinator of jewellery at Melbourne Polytechnic for nine years. So uh, I enjoy teaching and um, still at it, still learning. Still so smiling. Here today doing hollow rings. So just wanted to entice you to give you an idea of why you would do a hollow ring. Traditionally, we sort of used to make gents uh, rings with a big signet on the top, the initials or, a, you know, uh, a large onyx or something like that. And a ring like that has a lot of gold in it, very heavy. Uh, these days, incredibly expensive. You could have three, $4,000 worth of materials in the ring. Um, so to be able to make it hollow, make it a bit more wearable um, is an advantage. Uh, if you're trying to save a couple of thousand dollars in materials. The other interesting thing about hollow rings, I'll show you a little sample here. You might be able to see the colour. It's a little bit hard to see. But uh, this is actually a titanium ring uh, with a silver sleeve. Uh, this one's actually been sealed up. So the titanium has a very low dome to it. And there's a sleeve goes all the way through and the titanium is actually slipped on and it has two little barrel rings, two little washers on the ends. And uh, that ring is secured by using ball punches. So a ball punch is put both sides of that ring and that sleeve is uh, flanged outwards to seal the titanium in. Now, the reason that type of construction is used uh, is because you can't heat a ring like this up to solder it closed. Otherwise, you'll change the color of the titanium. So another example would be, that's also a titanium ring. It's a gray, gray titanium as opposed to the colored, the colored one. This one. This one's the blue, bluey purple. This one's gray. And this one will actually come apart. Uh, it's very tight. That's the little washer on one end. And then the titanium actually comes off the sleeve. That's the hollow portion, which has got a lovely half round curve to it. And here is your sleeve with the other portion. This is the other collar on the other side. So it allows you to make up basically two washers with a sleeve that will fit onto your finger and the titanium slips in between the two. And then it's like an external rivet. It's riveted together effectively. So it allows you in this sort of way to put together materials which you normally wouldn't be able to put together under heat. So um, that's one of the advantages of being able to make a hollow ring with that sort of rivet style connection. And that goes back on there and that would be riveted closed. Uh, here's another ring. This one is uh, Mokame Garne. Again, a little bit hard to see, but it's a copper silver alloy with a textured pattern and it has an 18 karat gold sleeve 
that's the gold sleeve, which would go onto your finger. And this is also hollow, hollow formed. So it has a lovely curved shank. And when the sleeve goes in, that squeezes in nicely. I'll show you how to do that over the course of the, the two sessions that we're going to have. And that could either be riveted or soldered to the Mokume Garne, depending on the, um, the patination that I want to have on my external surface. Yeah, that's a beautiful it's, ring, Chris. It's a lovely ring. It's a lovely pattern. A lot, a lot of work involved just getting that pattern in there. Mm. The, the lovely silver and copper. And then you've got the contrast of the 18 karat gold internally, which is you know, really very beautiful. Uh, here's another Mokume ring. Very, very fancy one. Has a very high top to it. It's not very wearable. That's your side view. And there are two different patterns either side. So the Mokume Garne has a uh, sort of a checkerboard pattern on that side. And it has a, a dot pattern on that side. Uh, and that, that ring is actually uh, held together again with a little sleeve. And it has an external band as well. So that band would be soldered on to the two, but the, the sleeve internally actually holds the two bits of uh, copper together nice and tightly, and that's, that's hollow internally. So it really reduces your weight down. It allows you to put together some really interesting materials. Uh, so it really gives people an opportunity to look at design, what they're, what they're putting together, uh, make something really fascinating, and you can start mixing and matching your shapes up. Here's another ring. This actually has four curved dome shapes put together and they've been soldered together. So it's a series of uh, washers that are hollowed out. Again, a sleeve that fits inside and we'll perhaps solder that one together next week. And then that sleeve can be cleaned off to the angle because it's quite a taper on that ring. It tapers down considerably if I take the sleeve out. You can see it drops away quickly towards the bottom, much wider at the top. And again, if that was in solid material, it would just it would just flip over on the finger. It would just be hanging down all the time. So it gives you a chance to produce voluminous work, really big work, um, create some shape to something, uh, use interesting materials, materials you can't solder on. It's it's a great technique. So we're going to get into the more basic start of how you'd make a hollow ring. So just the two components, the actual hollowed section and the sleeve section, how to calculate those, how to think about how you put them together, the sort of sizes you need to work on, this, 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 the, uh, yeah, the size frame. There's a lot of difference between the two bands. And then we'll go through the soldering a bit more next week. But I'll show you how to do the basics. So... Most of us start off in fabrication with a profile silver bar. So I've got six millimeter profile that I use. And I've rolled down this particular piece is around about five millimeters. And then I flat rolled that in my rolling mill down to a flat sheet. And I've created a few different sizes of sheet. I've created a sleeve, which is thinner and this will be the hollow section, which is a little bit wider. See the different widths there. One's about eight mil, the other one's about five mil. Because when we actually dome this material, it will end up with the curvature to it. And as you curve the metal around, it will approach the, the width of the sleeve. So you do have to start off with quite a wide sleeve to get that type of a dome. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I'm going to show you how to do that. So if there's any questions at all, ask Peter and I can answer them for you. So in terms of calculations, you, if you're making for a client or a specification to a, say a ring size, it's fairly straightforward to make up a sleeve. It's like making any normal ring. You'd probably work to 0.9 of a mil or one mil in thickness, depending on the thickness of material you like to have on the actual sleeve, what, what actually sits on your finger. And obviously if you're making a ring to a size, this is the complexity of this uh, project, you need to make the 
sleeve to the finger size, uh, the, the trick is to know how large to make the hollow ring to fit the sleeve. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not that straightforward. But to give you an idea, you're going to have to make your, your thicker strip of metal around about eight to 10 sizes larger than your sleeve size. So if you want a ring, let's say um, size M, size N, you're probably going to be working up around X, Y, Z uh, for your hollow ring section, because as it's curved around in the doming block, you'll see how it shrinks in diameter. So uh, I'll keep you guessing for a little bit longer. So once we've taken our flat sheet, which I'm going to do in a moment, we're going to bend that up into a, a ring shank, uh, hopefully around about size uh, Y or Z. In my case, I'm going to make quite a large one. And then after we've made that, what appears to be another larger ring shank, we will dome that and that will become our, our hollow ring section. So that's the flat band at one millimetre, roughly eight mils wide. And that's our hollow ring, which has been domed up in the doming block, which uh, has reasonable height to it. Yep, so that's now two and a half mils high. So quite a reasonable dome section on it, but you can, you can make them higher. It depends on how far you want to push the, the material. Okay, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm going to, I've uh, annealed this material. So it's very important your material is st as straight as possible. So no bananas that way in your metal, it has, it has to be straight. It's got a bit of a wobble to it, but it's fully annealed. And we're now gonna cut that to size. So I'm gonna cut this at around about 73 millimeters, which is around about size Z. Just checking this on my verniers. Gonna cut that through. And then I'll show you how we're going to bind that up. Straighten that up now. Just taking the burr off the end. Always make sure you take the burr off. I've done this demonstration before at AJS in Melbourne, so I'm looking forward to doing that again in the future. It's nice to have uh, actual students in the classroom. Real live people. Real live students, but this, this will do anyway. I'm sure you're all watching. So there's my strip at 74 mil. We should be up around about size Z. I'm now going to use my ring benders, or you can actually use your, your bench benders as well uh, and get that into shape. So I'm going to bring that around. You notice that I've annealed my metal prior to cutting the ends off. Uh, I'm a bit of a fastidious jeweler. I, I, I understand fire scale really well. If you ever cut something to length and then you put it through the fire, you really need to clean your ends off so that your ends are, have a clean sterling silver end on them. That's very important if you want a good join. So I'm going to bend my two ends around with my trusty ring benders, which I know you can get from AJS. These are probably the best tool you can actually buy. They're, they are very handy. I'm now going to use my ring bender, which is behind me on the block. Just get a bit more of a natural size Z shape to my end. And I'm just going to come back and bend that up 
Nice and evenly. It's very important how your join comes together. I'm just sort of slowly bring that up to shape. Make sure I don't get a twist on it. I'll check it in a moment on my ring mandrel. Just a little bit more tension. Just hear that sort of clicking past. Very wide this ring, so I have to be very careful that my joins actually align properly. I don't uh, take any shortcuts. So I'm going to just twist one side down a little bit just to make sure they're absolutely parallel, both sides. Looks a bit better. More. Excellent. So you want a, a really very clean join across there, nice and tight. You want to keep your ring as round as possible. Don't be tempted to mush them down and have them straight because you'll create tension and problems. A lot of people do this, they actually make a ring up or a setting up and they flatten them off with the parallel pliers. Very bad move. It's a very bad habit to get into because where you do, where you take that out of the round shape, you're creating a tension which will come back to potentially haunt you. So I've now got my band together. Make sure I don't have a, uh, if, if I had to, I could cut through that band and uh, straighten the join. I don't want any cracks or sole the filling. Just want a lovely clean joint. And that probably just needs a bit more of adjusting, but that's pretty well close, ready to bind up. So I pre-prepared my band. I've actually bound one up with binding wire. I'm gonna get that as close as I can to the camera. So, I'm going to show you how to do this on the other band. You see there's a little cradle there, little U-shape that goes over my joint. So I'm going to show you how to do that. It's a nice little trick. I have various binding wires from sort of 22 up to about 8 gauge. So I'd like to use quite a heavy gauge for this, probably around about 12, which I've twisted. So it's got reasonable tension, this binding wire. I like to double it up. So... As you know, your binding wire comes on spools and that's quite a heavy gauge wire, which I use for silversmithing. And that's quite a skinny, about a 20 gauge for, for jewellery, which you can use singly or doubly. So it's good to have a selection of binding wire. I think AJS have a pretty good selection of binding wires. And uh, if you have that sort of 22 to eight gauge, you've got a cross section of wires to give you the tension that you need for the job that you're doing. And that's experience. So I'm gonna take my binding wire and I'll take the ring that I had before. This is the ring I've just, just put together with the join. It's not unjoined. I'm gonna wrap the wire around the ring, starting at the join, come to the back, twist the wire with my fingers. And those that know me quite well will realize I'm very fussy about binding wire. It should be really, really neat. It shouldn't just be quick and rugged. It needs to be beautifully bound up because again, the binding wire is what controls your job. And if you do it beautifully, uh, the tension that you're trying to create will be nice and equal. So I'm just gonna snip those ends off because I wanna use those. So I've sort of bound the ring up, little tail at the other side from the join. My join's actually at this side here. 
But what I want to do is create a little archway across my join so that when I run the solder, the solder does not run down the binding wire, which people spend years getting wrong. And uh, it's, it's, it's a good little trick, this one. I'm happy to pass it on to you. So I'm going to take the rest of my binding wire. Just going to twist up that little end section so I can use it all. Call me Scrooge. It's all beautifully twisted. And with that little stub, it's about 15 mils long. I'm going to do a double curve. So I'm going to curve it with my round and flat pliers and do a U shape that way. And then I'm going to go perpendicular to that and curve it the other way. So I've got this kind of crazy U shape. Use one way and it curves the other way as well. And I'm going to slip that onto my join. I'm just going to use my little trusty screwdriver, sharp edge. Just going to open that out a little bit above, below the join. I've lifted that binding wire up and I'm going to slip this one underneath if I can. There it goes. And by having that double U shape, when I get to the U, the, the wire forms like a little cradle. It's probably not as sexy as I, I'd like it to look. I'll just find my other pliers. Gonna bend that up because I want the first binding wire to fit into the curve of the second binding wire. So I've got a little U shape that way, and I'm looking across the join. I can see straight down the join. I've got a little gap through three mils either side of the join because it's lifted that binding wire up from the join. And when I tighten now my binding wire down, I have cheated on this because my joint's not as good as it should be. But I'm now gonna retighten my original binding wire, put some tension onto it. That will bring the two sides of the ring very tightly together. And that little U-shaped binding wire lifts the first binding wire off the join and I can now flux that and I can run the solder through. I can use my tweezers and I will not get sold or running down my binding wire, joining the binding wire to the ring, which is nice if it's an expensive ring, you just save yourself lots of time and lots of solder damage. So I did that earlier and there I am. I've, I've arrived ready to solder. So I'm gonna solder this with you. So Chris, is that a trick that you've taught yourself or um, did you learn that? Somewhere? Someone pass it on to me and I'm happy to pass it on to everybody else. Oh, well done. It's amazing what you learn from other people and it's great to pass knowledge on to people. Uh, it took me about, my first uh, employer was Ken Gray, fabulous mentor, great, great jeweller. And uh, I'd come out of university. I'd just finished my first jewellery degree. Sorry, I'm full of anecdotal stories. When you've been That's right. making jewellery as long as I have, you've got lots of stories. Anyway, I turned up one day and I, I was soldering like this and he said, are you left-handed or right-handed? And I said, I'm, I'm right-handed. He said, well, you've got the torch in the wrong hand. That needs to be in your left hand if you're right-handed. And I said, oh, but it doesn't feel right because I don't have any control. He says, ah, but you're right-handed. So your tweezers are where you need control and your tweezers have to be in your right hand and you have to learn to use your left hand. There you go. First thing I ever learned from a professional person. Mm. So, yep. And you've stuck with that one. I've stuck with that one. So <laughs> all my students, I've always asked them, are you left or right-handed? <laughs> always. And they often think I'm sort of discriminating, right? Because it's a, it's a right-hand person's world. But uh, I'm just trying to help them. If yep. you're left-handed, you should have the torch in your right hand. And if you're right-handed, you should have the torch in your left hand. Because your dominant hand is the one that you need to have the finest control. Indeed. So your tweezers are always in your dominant hand mm. because you're always transferring solder and holding things and 
that's your hand of dominance. But if you're left-handed, you're probably a better jeweler than me anyway, because all the left-handers are the best jewelers. <laughs> it's true. Well, they say left-handed people are creative. Yeah. Oh, hang on. I'm right-handed. I'm creative too. Yeah, well, that's right. The, yeah. No, I think because left-handers live in a world where, you know, even our files, these are made for right-hand people. They're not made for left-handers. Okay. The minute you start filing that way, the cross cut on the file is not is not right for you. So no. left-handers often make a lot of noise when they're filing and it's not their fault because the files are actually meant for right-handed people. But I could tell you some other funny stories about, you know, uh, square drill bits and stuff like that, but that, another time. So I've got my torch going. I'm just going to cut a little bit of solder here. Now, um, because this is going to be the hollow part of the ring, it's going to be the curvy part, which I'm going to do the most work to. I'm going to use medium solder. I usually use hard for all my first joins, but because... Uh, it's medium is more flexible. It's going to allow me to um, to do more work without the join splitting. So uh, that's why I'm using medium silver solder. How are we going for time? Oh, time just race away, doesn't it, when you're having fun? <laughs> it does. So we're going to get this solder together, and then I'm going to show you how to uh, shape it up a bit. So I'm just cutting a few pretty decent sized pieces of medium. Always cut more than you need. And you might've noticed I flambe this with my boracic acid mix. So it's been protected with flux, boracic acid metho mix, which I keep away from my flame. Two parts boric acid, one part borax, just to reduce the fire scale. So that's sort of white now and coated up, but I'm now gonna add my Tenacity. I need a fair, fairly big flame for this, it's quite a big ring. And as I heat the ring, then I apply the flux. You shouldn't flux your work until you've started to heat it because uh, you, you end up using a lot of flux and uh, there's no need for that and you want to draw the flux into your joint. So if the joint is hot while you're heating, it just penetrates the joint nicely and you've got flux where you need it. So nice, quite a, quite a decent flame. It's quite a big flame. I'm going to beat up my solder because that's what I learned to do. Just turn it into little beads. Pick up one of my medium solders and my tweezers. And I've actually got the join facing away from me. So my join is on the far side away from me. So I can heat the band up and watch the inside of the band as, it, as the solder runs down. Then I'll turn it over. Okay, here we go. So heat that up at the back. I'm annealing the ring so that the join will not open. So I take all the tension out of the back of the ring with that... Uh, Twisted binding wire is. Just drop my solder D. So I'll find another one. Joint's gone glassy. Just drop my bead again, but I can find it. And I'm just working that, I'm not getting it too hot, just keeping it glassy. I've just placed my little bead right on the top of the join there. Heat the back of the band, back to the bead. And this way I can shoot the heat across the ring, through the ring. And when I'm ready, I can bring the flame forward. And bang, beautiful, straight down the join. So there's my little U shape up the top there. And the solder's gone through. I just checked the front. There's enough solder on there. That's looking good. It's lovely and clean. And that's the way you want to keep your silver. Don't heat your silver up till it goes black and horrible and fills up the fire scale. Uh, that's really very tidy. Very white on the join and a little bit pink around the sides, but that's a nice clean silver ring. Quench that off. 
And now I've got the joy of taking my binding wire off and it's not stuck to the solder because, of course, silver solder joins to the steel. So I just have to go in very quickly with a pair of pliers and either just untwist at the back there. Presto, it fell straight off. So the problem is if you put the binding wire on, like normal, the solder would run, the solder would have run down the binding wire and I would have been stuck with binding wire like that stuck to the solder and I'd have had to peel it off the ring with the pliers and filing the solder away. So I think everyone's learned something today about clever use of binding wire, just making your life easier. So it's lovely and clean, that ring, nice and white. Uh, that could go into hot water, but I do have pickle here, so I'm going to pickle that off just to remove the glass, the flux glass. So we had a comment from Joseph, and he was impressed with that there, Chris. So well done. Joseph's learned a, a nice little trick. Go for it, Joseph. So one we prepared a bit earlier. Now we're going for time. Okay. So this is one that's been soldered. And because it's been soldered, it's, I've actually hammered this up a little bit, but it's uh, nice and clean. What I now have to do is I have to make sure my sides are absolutely parallel because I'm going to be driving this ring into the doming block. And if I'm driving that into the doming block and my top and bottom edge are not parallel, then the ring will lose its shape and I will not get a, a nice, even, hollow, curved band. So I'm going to flatten those off, make some noise. I'm just using a uh, first an O cut or a double O cut file. Take my solder off, make sure my edge is clean. Go to the other side. So this is the outer sleeve I'm working on, everybody. The curvy bit. The bit that we're going to dome up. So you've got to use your trusty verniers and you've got to be very sure that it's the same width. So I've got uh, 7.5 mil. 7 7.5. 7.55. 7.5 and, and a touch. So there's a little high point there. Let's take that off. Try that again. And just uh, just see whether it spins in your verniers. It's gonna, if your vernier is nice and parallel, you'll see whether you've got a high point or not. And obviously it's going to spin around the high point. High points up at the top there, but it's pretty good. A little bit high there. I'm going to come down to a, sec a second cut, so I use a half round. It's using the flat edge of the half round. needs to be flat. It doesn't have to be super fine, just nice parallel size to my band. Nice and straight. Let's have another look. My parallels are so old, they're probably not parallel. Uh, 7.45. 7.45. 7.45. 7.45, that's straight enough for me, but that's important. Okay, now this has a bit of a burr to it uh, because I've been filing it off and I don't want the, that to catch on my doming block because I'm going to be driving it down. So I'm just going to take a little bit off with the second cut file. So I'm going to go around the ring just a couple of times.
using the flat of the half round file. Because I've tapped this ring up, it has um, little planishing marks in it. So it's going to be a little bit hollow in the centre. Because when you tap a ring up on the mandrel, you'll find that you have a slight curvature to the band because as it comes up the mandrel, it flares on the end of the thicker end of the mandrel. And because you turn your ring over when you're sizing it up, you end up with a little flare. That's already better. So that's what I'm going to do now is just put a slight, very, very small, 45 degree chamfer. So that will, when it sits in the block, it will want to curve as I smack it into the block. So I'm just gonna put a very small chamfer, just tiny, just taking the burr off really. This is on the outside, don't worry about the inside. We're not gonna be touching the inside. You could do this with a 400 emery, but so side one. And you can hear it when it comes off. You can hear it change as it, as it happens. You can hear the burr getting released. And then the sound of the file changes. Much smoother. It's got a lovely, very gentle, smooth external edge because that's going to drive down into the block and the curvature of the block, we want it to slide rather than catch. And if you're doing a uh, titanium ring, that's really important because uh, if you're driving titanium into a steel block, you can actually damage your steel block. Mm. So if you're working with very hard material like that, you really need to uh, make sure you've got smooth edges so you're not chopping in. Right. So this is the exciting stage of how you can use your um, AJS doming block. So I've actually got two of these. You can tell I love, I love my tools. Um, I've got a smaller one, which I probably bought in Germany years ago, and I bought this one from AJS quite a while ago. I've got a nice big 55 millimeter dome in it, slightly smaller block. This one is a very good German quality one. It has a slight edge on all of the holes. They're slightly chamfered, which is quite handy. This one is a little bit sharp on the edges, but every block is a bit different, and it's nice having... Yeah, in between sizes, between 50 mil and 54 mil and 53 mil, and you, you can do more with it. So it's good having a, I'd recommend you buy a decent block. Don't get a, a cheap little one, get a big one you can do a lot with. I mean, I can do a lot with really big, uh, you know, domes like that. Of course, you need to have big punches to fit the dome, uh, but, um, you know, fantastic. This, I use these tools all the time and they are incredibly, incredibly useful. But today we're going to be using a flat piece of steel to drive this in. So you will we'll need a flat steel plates. And I'm pretty sure you can get these at AJS as well. Uh, nice flat plate, nice and clean. And I'm going to be hammering on that. So you do need a steel plate and something that's hardened. That's, that's definitely a hardened steel. So... We're trying to create a curve form and we're trying to create it evenly. So if I sit that form on the block and I hold it up, it's only just peering out of the top of the block. So I probably need to go down a bit further. That's a bit better. It's sitting up about two mil. And then I've got to work out which holes I need to get into. That's sitting up around about three mil. So I'm going to start where it's just sitting up a couple of mil. And I'm going to place that steel on top. You know, it's a very fine gap between the two. And I'm going to be hammering down on the steel. And that will be driving the silver into a curved shape. And whatever I do on one side, I have to do on the other side. So a couple of taps down on one side, reverse it, same on the other side. This is critical. Because if you try to uh, curve one side only and then come back to the second side, your ring will collapse. You have to remember that the ring is fully annealed and as you create tension in a form, you have to create equal and opposite tension. If you don't do this gently, either side, one side of the band will collapse and you'll have a, a funny curve. You won't have a nice, even half round shape. 
Another way of doing this without making as much noise as I'm going to make is to have a um, ring sizer. The ring sizing machines are fantastic. You can size your rings up and down. But at the bottom of the ring size, where you've got the force that squeezes the rings into the little blocks at the bottom, uh, you can actually use that little lever and that force to push down into your block rather than smacking with a hammer. So just think about that. Great, great tool, ring sizer. You can do more than just size rings. So I'm going to select that opening that allows it to sit up by just a couple of millimetres. Could look after my ears. Nice, decent hammer. Get my two blocks parallel. Couple of taps, turn it over. Nice and parallel. That's happening beautifully. So a little bit hard to see, but it's gone from flat and it's starting to curve around both sides. So I'm trying to leave the center alone, but I'm trying to curve my edges around. So I'm now gonna go into the next hole down. So that was that hole where it was sticking up by about two mil. Now I'm only up by about one mil. So I'm gonna go down a bit further. So I've got a bit more, I can drive it down. to turn it over. Back over again. I'm pleased checking. you're a good shot, Chris. I'm pleased you're a good shot. Sorry? I'm pleased you're a good shot. I'm a good shot. We, we didn't want to see a finger get nailed there. No, <laughs> no, no, I haven't nailed the finger yet. Almost there. That's better. Excellent. So I've managed to drive that one into the second opening. And it's almost flush. It's driven it down beautifully. You must keep checking, keep going side to side. Otherwise you'll, you'll notice quickly you'll lose control. And I've got a really lovely half round. So a band that was, remember only, only 0.95 thick, is now, put my other glasses on, get rid of these. Yep, I've now got 2.2 mils in height. So I've got a lot more height. I've got a nice bubble in there, but I can take that even further. So that can definitely go more bulbous, much more bulbous. It's a good idea to work the material really hard. I don't, people ask me, oh, when do you anneal? Oh, it's getting hard to hit. I'm worried, Chris, I better anneal it. If you get tempted to anneal it early, the ring will collapse. 
you'll hit it a couple of times and the tension somewhere else will force it to collapse. But when you do anneal it, you've got to start with the same principle, just gently one side, turn it over gently the other side, it will continue to come around. So um, depending on the material, I mean, obviously you can't anneal titanium, but with silver or gold, you may have to anneal it once after that much work. But I'd, I'd happily keep going on that. Just keeping an eye on it that you're not, uh, you're not doing anything where it's going to collapse. So we've got a comment from Robert. He's very impressed with your uh, curving abilities there, Chris. So well done. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fun thing to do, actually. So it mm. feels great. So this is the one I've done earlier, which is much wider. But you see they've both got a nice curve to them. And where's the one I'm going to do? Yeah, so fitting the sleeve, having over time. We've got about a quarter of an hour left. So one I've done previously has been curved, perhaps a little bit higher, but it's a much wider ring. And no, it can't be that one. Got to make sure I've got the right sleeve for it. Might, might have just curved my sleeve. No, doesn't matter. Um, so uh, that one, Yeah, I think I probably did cur curve one of my sleeves. Let's see if I can get that one to there. No, can't get that one into there. So I can do the one I just did. That's all right. I got confused here because I've got two almost identical. This one. So this one's pre-curved. And this is the sleeve I've got for it, which I've made previously, which is size N and a half. So this is where I said earlier, you have to make your sleeve to fit your customer clearly, and you've got to make the band to fit, the, the external band to fit. So you won't be able to see it, but that sleeve is clearly not quite fitting in there. It's overlapping, which is good. I've started to file the sleeve off externally. So you need to have a nice flat, clean edge because it's going to be a soldering edge. And this is where you have to work out whether to make the, this ring eight sizes bigger or 10 or six or five to fit that particular sleeve. So, you know, if you get it wrong, you're obviously going to have to cut it through and join it, which can be in a bit of an issue. So uh, you do have to work on much larger calculation. So I'm going to now file this curved band to fit that sleeve because next week I'm going to actually show you how to solder them together safely. I've got a stone I'm going to do with mine. I've got a nice uh, big cab tourmaline uh, and I'm going to uh, make a setting for it. So I'm going to use this, this wider band. So taking that curved ring, uh, I don't need to anneal it at this stage. It's under tension, but it's okay. I'm going to take my zero cut file and start filing out a bit noisy because I'm working on two very sharp edges now. After you've curved up that band, you're going to have just sharp edges to work on. You've really got to flatten them right off to get that sleeve to introduce. And that's miraculously already going through. That was quick. I wasn't expecting that. You have to check all the time. It's probably a little bit loose. So you do have to go through. I'm just going to, um, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to just smooth that out a bit with the second cut file. So it's really a fitting exercise at this stage. Creating a, you probably want an edge that's uh, 0.7 of a mil, a soldering edge. You don't want to be soldering onto a sharp edge. That's way too loose. So I might just smack this down, just tighten it up a little bit more, see if I can do that. If 
lot of curve on that one. Just jammed it up in the uh, dining block, so I should have get it out. Ooh, that is tight. I hit it that hard. No, so I've probably got just a nice high curve to this, so it does want to jam up. Might just put a little bit of oil on it. Just to boil that out a little bit. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my other block. Might have a better better aperture in it. No, I don't think so. Very tight. Extremely tight. Yeah, I'm going to have to. Uh, it's better on this side. So, yeah, you'll find as you curve up, uh, as you get to that proper true half round, it will get quite tight in the block. So you can you can see that's happened to me already. So I'm actually going to tap, tap up my ring size. So I'm going to I'm I'm allowed to cheat, aren't I? <laughs> Yeah. No. <laughs> Get my ring hammer. So if you've got any questions for this session, it's a good if you put them to Peter now. So the next session we're going to be um, actually bring them together, soldering them together, and talking about some of the safety things that you have to do when you're soldering, especially when you're closing up an object like this. It's uh, not that smart to uh, try to close up an enclosed space when you're solving. It can be quite dangerous. So I'm going to encourage you not to do that. And that's a much, much tighter fit. It's not quite there. I just need to flare those sides out a little bit more. But what we're after is a sleeve that, will protrude roughly half a millimetre either side of my half round band. So it just has to be that little bit wider. So as you make these rings up, I hope you give it a go. You're going to have one that's going to start quite wide, one that's going to start a bit smaller. You're going to curve the wide one into your hollow section and it's going to, the sleeve is going to slip inside and you want your sleeve eventually to be that little bit wider so that you have a soldering surface to apply your solder to. So, uh, yeah, the next session I'll show you how we're going to, I'm going to do one, as I said, with the, with the stone in it so the top will be open. Um, I definitely do not advise you solder that closed both sides without having a, an air ventilation hole somewhere on the inside of the band or somewhere on the outside of the band because that can be extremely dangerous. Um, I think safety is a pretty important thing. When you close up a space like that or you make a ball or a sphere, there's always the risk that if you allow the sphere to cool and then you go back in again with the heat, the sudden expansion inside can make it actually explode on you, which is not a, not a good look. So uh, I want to go through this with you next week. Mm, yeah, good advice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's the first part of hollow ring making um, is to think about your design. 
give it a go, work in silver, start with, you know, two, two bands and um, attempt to, to bring, marry the two together because it's very complex. You know, one has to be eight to ten sizes bigger than the, than the sleeve. Uh, it's surprising once you curve it around how quickly it loses its, its size. Uh, that, that ring I started with before was size Z. And if we check it now for size after I've curved it up, it's size T. So we've gone from here to here. And if you look at the sleeve, the sleeve is down here, but the two actually married together. So it gives you an idea of we're going from here to here with the outside and the sleeve is the, the customer size and one has to fit with the other and marry together. So fairly complicated. Yes. I hope I haven't lost anybody there. No, we've got some uh, nice comments, uh, Chris. Uh, Kay Wood, do you know Kay? I know Kay. Hello, Kay. Uh, he says in big capital letters, hi, Chris, great to see you. Uh, I'll have to give you a buzz. Your Gil Bestie K. <laughs> there you go. Good to uh, see you, Kay. Well, I wish I could see you. <laughs> and Robert White. Do you know Robert White? Uh, I think I know the name. Yeah, so he's had a number of nice comments along the way. So um, Very nice. Yeah, that's good. And nice that you're here, Robert. Diana said, sorry, I missed the beginning. What thickness is the middle? Look, I'd, I'd work 0.9 to 1 mil. One millimetre is very good in sterling silver. Point, point 0.9 to one mil. Reasonable thickness, gives you some strength. So both both pieces could be, you know, point 0.9 or one mil. No worries. And, Diana, this video will be on Facebook for all time, so you can come back and watch it later if you like. Uh, Jeanette Marnell brown you know Jeanette? Hi, Jeanette. How are you? Fantastic as usual, she says. Thanks. So... Uh, you're at the last you one. Fan club out there, Chris. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got. I'm very lucky. I've got some very good colleagues and friends. Very nice people. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, um, thank you so much for our introduction. Absolute so, pleasure. Uh, making hollow rings, and we'll resume this uh, same bat time next week. So next Thursday. Looking forward to it. Uh, we'll be on Facebook and lots of soldering and uh, filing next week. Yeah, actually, and we're blessed with the microphones. There's some bit of technology that once you do a few taps, the mic's cut out. Oh, really? Yeah, so, and then they resume the as mic. soon as you start talking. So, yeah, so that's good. We only get a couple of taps and then the rest is uh, just, we're just watching. So that's good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try not to tap too much then. <laughs> no, you're fine. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. We'll call it quits there and we'll look forward to seeing you. Thank soon. you. So on behalf of the Guild and AJS, thank you and uh, see you next week, everybody. Thank you. Bye.